going to call to order this meeting of the Education and Culture Committee. And Councillor Garvin, would you offer the prayer, please? Yes. <clears throat> Father in heaven, creator of all things, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our well-being. We ask now that you would guide us and lead us as we make decisions for our Cherokee people. Be with our loved ones, especially our military personnel all over the world and their families here. We pray for our visitors and we pray for our elected officials. And Father, we want to pray for our country. And pray that you forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And next we have roll call. Julia Katz. Here. Don Garvin. Bonnie. Bill Anglin. Bill John Baker. Here. Jack Baker. Here. Harley Bowser. Here. Bradley Cobb. Bonnie. Joe Crittenden. Here. Jody Fishinghawk. Meredith Fraley. Here. Janelle Fulbright. Here. Chuck Hoskin Jr. Here. Tony Glory Jordan. Present. Curtis Snell. Here. Chris Sub. David Thornton. Kara Cowan Watts. We do have a call. Thank you. Next we have approval of the March 14th minutes. Well moved. Second. The motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, aye. Any opposed? Uh, and we will move to reports. And first we have career services and Diane Kelly. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, we have had a real exciting month, as always. Every month is exciting in career services. <laughs> uh, last month, I told you that we were working with uh, Cherokee Enterprises and some of their businesses, and that's one of the reasons why it's been real exciting. Uh, we have actually opened the door, and uh, the Spirit of God, we were working with them at West Salem Springs. We had students at our job for center that toured last Friday in our uh, building and apartment maintenance in our food uh, culinary arts department. And then tomorrow we're hosting the uh, management staff at West Salem Springs at the job court and they're going to visit our trade classes. And then we're going to work out our timelines for our students to do the work-based learning there at their facility and then also follow up with work practicum. And then we're going to run a bus down to pick up the students, take them up there, and then as they work through their uh, work practicum and work-based learning, then some of those students uh, that are Cherokee can actually apply for some of the jobs. Uh, one of the things that uh, their food and beverage director told us was looking at our curriculum that we have over there, that some of the things that the students are already in is farther along than some of the people they're actually hiring. So he's real excited, and we're excited because it's going to open the door for some jobs for these kids. Um, also, uh, we're doing it as a pilot project with food and beverage. Then we'll follow that up with electrical building, apartment maintenance, and business tech. Our health careers programs, we're working with Rick Richards and Home Health. We met with him today. Uh, we're looking at the career ladders. And some of you ask about what career ladders were. I have an example of what uh, the career ladders look like. If you don't want this, just bring, pass it on back up here and I'll, I'll keep it. Uh, for those of you that are interested. This is just an example of what uh, we're working on right now. We're working on career ladders for food and beverage so that if you apply for a job at one of our establishments, then you can see where you could actually get some training and you could move up the ladder within that career if you stayed with it. Uh, this is just on health, but we did this with food and beverage. We're doing it with our IT department. We're also doing it with uh, the uh, housekeeping and maintenance area as well. Um, we also have information about a vocational training program and this should uh, hit home with you Mr. Snell since you've been over at the Votec visiting with uh, Mike over at Votec. He told me that you've been over there asking him about setting up some classes up there. We're in the process of setting up a food and beverage uh, for uh, I'll let you read what the phases are, but it's to acquaint the people with the different histories on various things in food and beverage, and we're starting the classes, and this will give you some information about those classes. We're going to start them with the Northeast Area of OTEC at Little Kansas, and the classes will be housed in our facility there at West Salem Springs, and Rudy is going to identify some of his employees uh, about 
maybe 10 or 15 for the class and then we'll recruit about 10 or 15 for the classes <coughs> and we're going to start these classes in May so this is kind of give you a rundown on that up at that area and what the tuition rate is going to be um, also in Katusa <coughs> we are in the process of working the day work program there at Katusa in our Claremore office right now the majority of the people are coming in at Pryor they're not coming in at Claremore and word probably hasn't gotten out that we're taking apps there but we're <coughs> going to be moving those people from Pryor over to Claremore so that we can get them placed there at the uh, CNE facility this is a example of a flow chart uh, somebody asked what the process was well this is the process uh, we will have uh, counselors there in the Claremore office that will be working with them. We started taking applications last week. We're taking them this week. <coughs> and we're hoping to get a few people placed next week. And then the following week is when, we, is when we'll actually start the day work program in that area. Uh, the next handout is information on our uh, life skills classes. In order for the people to go through the program for the day work program, that we're referring over they have to go through life employability skills classes uh, and uh, Kelly Forrest is our lead teacher on this and then we have a couple of other teachers that are teaching this so in order for them to come into the day work program we're work keys testing them and then we're doing the life skills classes with them uh, in addition to all that work Stephanie Isaacs and her staff are working with Chris Paxton out of Bob Schooley's program to do work keys testing for all of their employees at C and E. So we're going to be a work ready community inside the Cherokee Nation. Uh, we have had several meetings on the one stop job bank marketing and branding. Uh, the next handout is information on the one stop branding and all the people that are involved in that. And we hope to have this rolled out by May, first part of May. See, I'm saturating with you all kinds of information so when you go out to these communities, you can tell everybody what we're doing and, and what some of the timelines are. Huh? No, I didn't get elected, you did. <laughs> here, is, here is a uh, rundown of our field offices. Somebody had asked about numbers. Uh, I don't think we had Claremore's on there. I think we have it on there now. So here are our office numbers. So, we also, and I, I didn't bring any of these, and I know Chuck wants some of these for sure. This is a little book that we got from the recruiters at our job fair in Salem Springs. It was the Marines, and they had it, and this was anger management book. And they give this to every everybody that goes through their program. And I asked him, I said, do you have any problems with us getting this and using it as part of our life skills program? So Kelly is taking these little booklets and we're putting it into uh, one of the phases of our life skills classes. And the reason that we're doing that is that when we went back and asked why some of these people lose their jobs, it's because of anger management. You know, they don't know how to take constructive criticism or when their employer or their supervisor tells them that they're not doing a good job, they get mad and walk off the job. Ms. Kelly, would you be able to secure 17 of those for this <laughs> I <topic>? bet I could. <laughs> but I wanted to share that with you because we do. We just got these in and I just picked one up out of the box and brought it with me. I thought y'all would get a kick out of that. You're 18, I need two of them. Well, and uh, our staff is real busy in the tarot office. Uh, we've been meeting with uh, Sean Slayton. Uh, John Overacker, I guess most of you know, John got married Saturday, so he's out of pocket for about a week. Willard Mounts is acting in his stead for the next week, so if you've got any problems with Terrell, I guess you can call me or call Willard. Uh, but uh, they are very busy working with uh, the construction areas. Uh, bids are getting ready to go out. Uh, Mr. Reedy was in a meeting that I was at uh, earlier today and told us that they're getting ready to get information out there about uh, Fort Gibson and uh, Ramona. And uh, he didn't give us any information about Tahlequah, but we know it's, it's coming down the pipe and uh, we're getting ready to add on, Mike, bring Mike Toodle back on uh, to help with that. 
I don't know if you know Mike. He, his wife uh, was ill, so he left us for a while, and he's supposed to be coming back pretty shortly. So, anyway, we're just busy, busy, busy. Yes, ma'am. Um, I noticed on this training for jobs for Cherokee citizens that there is a t tuition fee of eighty-five dollars associated with taking uh, this class. I wonder if there's some way if a person has applied for one of these jobs and been turned down with uh, our CNE group, if there's a way that we could cover that fee so the next time they apply, they will have this training. Now, the $85 is for phase one, and it doesn't cover all four. It's just for each phase. Okay, so here's what I'm asking. See if this is a possibility, and maybe you could work with CNE to accomplish this. I don't see why if we've had a Cherokee that has applied for one of these jobs and we tell them no you do not have the experience to get this job why we would not want to see CNE foot the bill for these people to get this training so when another job opens up they will now have the training needed for that Cherokee to get that position over a non-Cherokee it's $85 a session, so if we've turned down a person that wants to work in these areas, we need to be, in, in my way of thinking, we need to be encouraging CNE to cover the cost of that person to go to these sessions so that the next time they apply, they will have this training. What we're doing, what we're doing, uh, Councilman Jordan, is that they are giving us the money to set the training up and then through uh, Rudy who was over food, <coughs> banquet, beverage, mm -hmm. he's going to identify people who have come through their program through our job fairs that, we've, that they just recently hired. He will identify probably about 10 people that he wants to go through this will training. Will they pay the $85 then? No, we will pay for it because they will have okay. given us the money so, for the training. When you say it's $85 per person, somebody is covering that for the yes, Cherokee that's yes, trying to get this yes. education. Yes, okay. and they that's will, be, I, they will yeah. be screening the applicants to get in the program. We're gonna make referrals to them then they will screen the applicants that are not employees. Oh, yes. Okay, second question then. Rudy's identifying the people that need to go through this and we're using the money to pay for them to go through it. Mm -hmm. Are all of those people that Rudy is identifying Cherokees? At this point in time, I can't tell you that mm -hmm. because this, this would be some of his people that are already gainfully employed by his mm -hmm. facility that he feels like that needs to go through the training. But you understand my concern. I understand your spend. concern, but we did not, mm -hmm. I, everybody that I recruit will be Cherokee, but everybody that he has that's already working, he is wanting to run them through this training course because they've not had any kind of okay. training. Then my question to you is to provide the information to us where Rudy, uh, who I do not know who Rudy is, where Rudy provides the people I want to know whether they're Cherokee or non-Cherokee and whether we provided the funds for them to go through this training session. And I don't mean anything bad by this, folks, but this is Cherokee Nation money. I want it to be used for Cherokees. And we're not here to improve the non-Indian worker. We're here to improve the Cherokee worker as far as I'm concerned. Because someday I hope we have 100% Cherokee employment now, over the, there. Now, the other thing that you need to know, and probably Mr. Snell knows this since he's been talking to Mike, anytime we contract with the VOTEC, if we don't fill that class up, the VOTEC offers that to anybody that comes in that facility that wants to take that class. So but they that, pay the $85, right? No, we're paying the instructor, but if we don't fill the class up, they can fill the class up. That's a guarantee, it's part of your contract. You have to have so many people in the class in order for it to be a class, and we pay the instructor. What they do is they have like a, a there's like maybe, we could say 20 to 25 is what a class is. And if we don't fill it up, we could advertise and we may only have 23, and say there's still two slots. The VOTEC, because they charge such a low tuition rate, they have the, uh, 
opportunity to put two students in that class of their choosing if we don't fill it up. We will fill it up, but that was something that was brought up, and I know that because I work for the Botech. Okay, thank okay. you. Councillor Fishing. But hey, if we pay for it, what does it matter if it's full up or not? Well, you have to have so many when you go into the class, the contract's set up for so many students. And in order for it to be a sanctioned class so they can get the certification, that's what you're paying that instructor for. You guarantee so much that you're paying. Okay. So you have to pay the instructor so it's coming out of your fees, but you have to pay the school so much for reproduction and any of the uh, incidentals uh, that go along with the class. Well, I, don't know. I was just curious because I feel like if it was a lesser class, that people would get more individualized instructions, you know, if it was a smaller class. And if we paying for it, I just didn't realize why, Diane. The other well, that's was, why he asked us. He said, do, how many do you want in the class? And we're okay. setting it at 20 to 25. He's going to put some of his employees in there if we don't fill it up. Okay. But, but the Votech said, now you realize that if you don't fill it up, we have the opportunity, because we have to publicize it in our catalog as one of the classes, that if you don't fill it up, it's kind of like the cat's van. Mm -hmm. Once you set up a schedule, if you don't fill it up and there's other people that want to ride, you have to let them ride. Okay. The other thing I would do, could you get, make sure we all get the same information that kind of asked for? Because I have dealt with Rudy before at West Salon, and a lot of my complaints on him come from Indians that felt like he was not advancing them. And I'm kind of like Diane, to put it bluntly, I don't want to pay to advance another non-Indian up our corporate ladder. I'm tired of them taking all the places. And I notice this says it's for, they're considered for uh, entry-level management. So when you give that information to her, could you send yeah. it to me to and, and I don't, I, I will take what you're saying under advisement, but the venue that you need to be relaying that to is to the c &E. Oh, I've already got down called Rick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's where it needs to be uh, yeah. relayed to. Okay. We're just question. working with them on the train. I was looking at your career ladder. Yes, ma'am. And it says, are we paying for the certified nursing assistant course ma'am? This is just part of the career ladder. I don't know if we are or if we're not. I have to know uh, which one. Certified what? The CNA. It was on that front page. I was just curious. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Bowser? Uh, Diane, I'm just curious about what happens to a day work per a day work person that goes in and you, you test him for the work he process and it doesn't do very well. What, what happens to this guy or person? What happens to him? Yeah. We still find him a job. Not everybody is going to pass the work piece. Majority of the people will, but there's a few people that come through and they don't. And sometimes it's it's just because sometimes they think backwards on the, the test. We do a paper test and then we also can do a computerized test. And we've been trying to do more paper tests than we have the computerized test. And they do better on the paper test. So so this is just a procedure that you go through that everybody takes the word through testing. Yeah. Uh, the and, state and, of and Oklahoma. That's good. I'm glad you did. Yeah. The state of Oklahoma uh, uh, is looked at as a work ready state. And they're trying to get more and more people work keys certified. And it's equivocal to ACT on the yeah. college mm -hmm. level, so it's more on the vocational work work area. Well, I'm just concerned, you know. So, so we do place them, even though they don't score high on the work key test. Yeah. In fact, if you ask the state of Oklahoma right now, they would tell you that Cherokee Nation has probably tested far more people than anybody here in Northeast Oklahoma, yeah. and we're continuing to test more and more every day. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Watson? Thank you. In your report. Um, and I apologize if, I don't, if you went over this before I got here, but the partnership with CMB on trainings and the five categories, I, I mean, I understand how that fits in the scope of our business dealings, but is that for existing employees and promotional opportunities, or is that for potential new employees? Both. It's for anybody that's already working in the system, but it's also for anybody who's coming in the system so that they can see what the career ladders are for those five areas which they deemed as revolving doors. IT, um, nursing was one, but that wasn't with CNA. <coughs> and then, um, let me see. It has healthcare, food, beverage, maintenance, cultural tourism, and child care yeah. listed. So what if somebody <coughs> off the street that's a Cherokee citizen uh, wants to do those any of those five areas, do we just send them to our local career services office? You can. 
Yes. Okay, and then they would be. And I handed out information about the job bank that we're working on with them. We should have gotten every one of the handouts. Here. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you all for coming to our Learning Center open house. It was a real success, and we appreciate it. Your help and support. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Next, we have the group leader's report from Ms. Knight. Thank you, Madam Chair. You all have our written reports this month, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about those. I do have a couple of, uh, one announcement and one other item to, that aren't reflected in our reports. Um, first of all, I mentioned last month, and I believe you all received a formal invitation to the Education Summit, which is this Thursday. So here's the agenda I'm handing out today for that event. Starting 9.30, the Skyrim uh, will be distributing the uh, motor, tax, motor vehicle tax funds at that event. Uh, we also have Secretary Hudecki, uh, the Secretary of Education for the Governor, for Governor Fallon um, at that event to not only speak but participate in a roundtable with us about education. We'll be taking questions from the audience so that educators can ask their questions of the Secretary and so forth about the state's plans in education. <coughs> The second item I wanted to talk about today um, is to follow up on a letter I received following our last meeting um, from, and it was signed, ultimately signed by 10 of you, uh, requesting that we review a policy issue uh, with regard to scholarships. And we have been reviewing that issue. Uh, originally, uh, concerned 31 students that um, uh, some of them appealed, some of them didn't appeal, but uh, we reviewed each case in terms of uh, uh, whether they didn't submit their d documents in the spring timely due to items that were within their control or outside their control. Um, the 31 students uh, were the students that remained after we made several exceptions due to the school failing to get a transcript out, um, uh, extenuating circumstances like health issues, deaths in the family, and so forth. We did review for all of those sorts of things. So these students are the students that remained after we reviewed for those extenuating circumstances. And you requested that, or several of you requested that we review those um, and consider funding them. Um, so I sat down with the staff and uh, reviewed the issues um, that are involved here. Essentially, we had a total of 373 students that did not continue from fall to spring for whatever reason. Either they uh, dropped out, uh, they may have graduated, they just, we just know that we had 373 less from fall to spring. Um, some of them, uh, 31 of them are these students um, <coughs> that we didn't fund. Um, as we received calls, uh, we shared with the students that if they were late with their documentation, they did not have extenuating circumstances that they could not be guaranteed to be funded for spring. So many of them, we know, chose not to follow up based on that phone call. We know that they chose, uh, we know that we didn't receive their documentation later. So we know that we talked to many, many students uh, and shared with them, this is our deadline. Uh, we can't guarantee you will be funded if you do submit your documentation after this date. So many of them chose not to do that. In fact, in fact most of them did not. Um, and that's where we get into somewhat of a dilemma. Uh, if we were to fund 31 students that went ahead and submitted their documentation, uh, are we being fair to the numbers of students that we talked to that <coughs> chose not to submit their documentation even though they may have had it after the deadline? <coughs> so um, we did, you know, we're, I reviewed that with the staff. I shared uh, much of the situation with the chief and since uh, 10 of you uh, brought it forward. Um, he would like to uh, discuss this with you all um, at the legislative conference this afternoon at 5 and it is my hope that following that conversation that some meeting of the mind can occur about what we should do. Um, something I'm concerned about is when we make a decision in order to be consistent is it something that we can continue year after year or should we have a go forward policy um, that is fair in the future. Um, 
looking retrospectively, it's, it's more difficult to be fair uh, because we told students one thing and now we may be doing something else. So do we need to publish something if we change our minds um, in order to be fair to all of those 373 students? And I think that's what you all should discuss this evening. Councilor Jordan? Um, on the, the uh, Cherokee Day Camps that you're going to have this summer? Yes. Uh, we've got the form. Is that income based in any way? No. I don't think so. So anybody, any child, first through the ninth grade, yes. as long as they get in that, probably that first 200 to yes. apply? Yes. It's usually first come, first serve. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I need to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Fishing Hawk? Yeah, uh, Millie, uh, some of us, and I guess all of us, received an uh, email, maybe it was for you, I'm not sure, about a student that was upset because of the scholarships. He said, my family's middle income, and I've done great in school, but now it's no longer based on merit, and because my family's middle income, you will not help me. Mm -hmm. How did, did you, re I guess you're nodding your head, so I'm assuming you got I received an email, uh, it was from a young woman, Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was the situation. What I've done is I've asked the staff to contact her directly, see what her situation is. Um, hopefully she understands the guidelines properly. I'm not sure of that because of course middle income folks are eligible. It is just the very high income people uh, that are no longer eligible for the scholarship. So I want the staff to talk it through with that student and, and make sure that you know, one, it's fully understood, and two, is she really not eligible uh, before we go further with that? But I'd be happy to report back what, what we please, find out. Please do. And then uh, I'm also curious, uh, about six months ago when I started asking about your ATC scores and you start, we all start conversation about them, I'd like to know the important average ACT score of our high schools in the 14 counties okay. in the different areas. And I'd like them compared to the state and national okay. ACT score. And maybe go in there, the average AT school, AT, ACT score of any colleges that we attend, like, you know, OU, NSU. And okay, where our students attend. primarily are. Yeah, I'd like to know their ACT And then I was looking at the Sequoia schools. It said number of disciplinary referrals this school year, 354. Mm -hmm. Is that not high, anybody? Well, I'm, I can check on that. I don't know what type of, dis you know, how severe we're talking a disciplinary issue is. So it could be any infraction. Probably. I kind of like to know. You know, I tell my son, your job is to go to school and make sure mama doesn't have to show up. That's your job. So I can do my <laughs> job. You know, and when I seen 345, I was kind of shocked. You know? well, I can check on that and see the range of infractions if it's, you know, every type of infraction. Okay. So. And there's that average, uh, the grade point average is 3.39. Mm -hmm. And the average ACT is 19. Does that correspond? Because before I've seen correspondence tables of schools, especially your schools that are maybe like mm -hmm. on your heavier subjects, they've got a really good GPA or a very decent one, but the ACT score is low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of it's test taking skills and all sorts of things. One thing that affects our average ACT is that um, you'll see when it's broken down by grade level below. Um, we have the freshmen all take the ACT as well, and a lot of schools don't do that, and so that that gets involved in our average. So, well, well could you see what the correspondence is? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, when you brought up the average ACT score, why is there a more than a two-point drop between the 11th and 12th grade year? And that's a really good question. I mean, it could be that we're getting better at ACT prep preparation with the younger kids. I mean, I you know I'm just not sure. It's just that uh, we have a different group of students, and that's the way it has averaged out. I mean, is it like that every year? Have you noticed the string constantly? I haven't noticed that as a pattern. I can review that if you'd like me to. Could you? Because in, in terms really of whether that's a me. pattern or not, that really stands out. Because to me, it seems like it should be going up, just like when a kid takes it night, kids eleven to twelve, mm -hmm. the classes, you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hoskins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the students who were not timely on their <coughs> documents, mm -hmm. um, my impression from talking to the ones in my district were that when they weren't timely, the Education Department communicated to them 
either by phone or, or I think I understood by mail that simply said you weren't timely so you're not being renewed. Mm -hmm. But am I hearing something different that actually they were told that they're, it wasn't that they weren't going to be funded, it was that they couldn't guarantee they'd be funded for the spring. Is that that's, what was That's the way we, um, as I understand it now, it's hard to say how each conversation went down and I'm talking mostly <laughs> about phone calls. And when students called just after the deadline and said, I'm late, I need to, I, can I submit it now? The staff would say, well, we'll accept it. You know, we didn't refuse anyone's <coughs> documentation, but uh, we couldn't guarantee they'd be funded. Then a, a le if someone didn't call in, but they got a letter mm -hmm. from higher ed, that didn't say, if you turn it in, we can't guarantee you that you'll yeah. be funded. It just it said, said they wouldn't late be funded. And we're declining to fund it. Yeah, and that's, yes. that's what I, I guess somewhat troubles me is if, you know, students who didn't turn anything in were told they were out. If they called, they were told, well, you might not be out. We just can't guarantee it. I just wondered if. Well, we did. We were clear with them that that's the policy. That we have a deadline, and we're. But but did they tell some of? I mean, to tell them that there's no guarantee suggests that there's a possibility if you get your stuff in, you'll get funding. Well, and I'm not sure that was understood by the students uh, because we talked to far more than 31 students, and they chose not for whatever reason not to turn it in. Yeah, I mean, my so, impression from the students I talked to is that it was if they weren't timely, they they were out, mm -hmm. which I can understand in policy. I just want to make sure that it wasn't some. I, you know, I don't think we were trying to lead students into thinking they would be funded. It, so. But but it, but it sounds like if they were told, if you get it in, there's a chance you'll get funded. We can't guarantee you'll get funded, but that implies there's a chance. I I really don't know. I think. How many people, I mean, when I talked to the staff, the number of students that they talked to were probably in the hundreds, and I would imagine that if they thought there was any chance they'd be funded, we would have seen a lot more students turning in documentation than we did not. But you don't feel like staff members told people on the phone. You could be funded. You can't, you, well, the, exactly what I heard, which is that we can't guarantee you funding, which to me implies there's a chance you'll get funding if you hurry up and get your stuff in. I really don't think so. Okay, because, and that um, makes me feel better because I think it would be a bad outcome if in writing people were told, you're out, but if they called, well, you might be yeah. in. And the calls, just to clarify, preceded the letter. You know, we send the letters out um, following all of that, but you know, of course we're getting inquiries all the time. You know, I can't get my things in, or I, the deadline's just passed. Can I send it to you now? That kind of thing. All right. Well, I, so. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Councilor Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a number of questions, but one of them was the same as the other councilwoman <coughs> in the sudden drop between 11th and 12th grade. Mm -hmm. If there's a way, I think I think it is important that we identify because that is an outcome mm -hmm. that affects a lot of number of things. The other thing is, I have a number of folks that said that they are salutatorians or valedictorians and they've submitted paperwork or they're about mm -hmm. to submit paperwork, but they're not on the list that was emailed out. Well, if you can send me so any information about those students. I they mean, said they just got forms and stuff like the other day, so I'm kind of confused about the disconnect. Can you reset, like, Yeah, I don't think forms? the deadline has passed on that. So. Okay, there is, when is the deadline? She, she mailed it out to all the Okay, and it's not posted online, which I think is problematic because if we limit well, it to a funnel at the yeah, school. We take the application from the school so that it will be official. They've officially designated these persons as valedictorian. Yes, and, and I understand that ultimately it would have to be done by that, but if there is a single point of failure, potentially and then they have to start tracking down, they find out about it mm -hmm. late. If I can point them at midnight to the website rather than trying to track you guys down on a weekend or something. Well, yeah, and if they don't have a, an application, certainly we can email, we can you know, do those things. We've, we've mailed it out directly to the administrators. So um, I think between me and a couple other council people were already overloading Diana Turtle's inbox. <laughs> so if we can <laughs> We can send it to it, this group if you like. Yeah, or post it to online or whatever that is. Um, yeah, I don't want to encourage 
valedictorian and salutatorian awards from individuals as opposed to schools because then it gets very confusing which is the official okay. app. So, so because we don't question it. it when it comes from the school. You know, this is who's been designated and we don't right. have to go verify that. So if we're getting it all at once, that would be helpful because I had a number of schools respond back. Then the other, um, <coughs> the I think I'd asked a prior meeting about the beginning level language courses and identifying which communities those were going into. Mm -hmm. And I and I think I sent a list of uh, the community classes to you. Okay, but I can check that. Would you? And mm -hmm. if you don't mind, just resend it because I don't okay. recall getting it. Thank you very much. Certainly. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Also, oh, Jordan. Yes, I forgot to ask you, Melanie, on the 373 students that did not receive money for between the fall and the spring, uh, what happens to that almost $750,000? Well, essentially, um, when we budget, we account for some attrition between fall and spring because that is not unusual. In fact, 373 is probably the lowest number we've seen in recent years on the attrition between fall and spring. and. Some of it is that we do have some fall graduations, you know, so we do have, it's not everyone that's dropping out. Um, and then we have some that don't continue for whatever reason of their own. Um, so it's uh, not always a matter of that we, you know, that they didn't get their documentation in and we didn't fund them. So, but, so that's sort of the scenario. So when we budget, um, we take into account that we fund approximately 2,700 in fall, and then usually about four more hundred less in the spring. And then I account for about a 10% growth rate because that's about what it's been. And that's the way we've we've been budgeting. So how many did, how many were funded in the spring? Approximately 2,400. So there was about 2,700 in the fall just as it. 2762 or something like that. So is there some money left for scholarships? There's not money left per se because we accounted for that difference when we budget. And so any more that we fund in the spring, like if we were to bring spring very close to the 2700 number we funded in the fall, we will be short by some number in the following fall based on our projections. Do we have the 30, approximately 31,000 to fund the 31 students? That is a small enough number it can probably be absorbed, but um, from a policy standpoint, and I told the chief this as well, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that because, because of the fairness issue in my view, but, but that's a decision you all can discuss. The, the other thing I want to know about is, when did you say the deadline was for the uh, valedictorian, salutatorian scholarship ad? I believe it's this Friday, but I can verify that when I send you the form. If you would verify that, because I don't believe all of the ones here locally are on this list either. Okay. And if we need to extend a short time to allow, and we usually do some checking as well for those schools we know will have a, uh, you know, should have a lot of Indian students, we do some verification. Could, could you uh, verify the deadline and send that to us by email so that we can email the schools and make sure that they haven't overlooked the deadline? And I just got a message from the staff and she's already planned to call each school before we finalize the list. So we'll be making, making phone contact as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Councilor Do we fund the Valentine Salute Horn in the two mile zone? Yes. Same schools. I mean, is that policy and procedure? I guess that was a policy that was implemented because I knew that was my legislative act, and I was just curious. Yeah, it was a policy, and we just followed that. Okay. That general area didn't include the same And schools. then I would like to go on the record as agreeing with you because if my child gets told, you know, you may not receive funding. As a parent, I'm going to hear that as there's a chance you might receive it. So, Hunter, you're going to go ahead and fill that scholarship out. I mean, I, I don't see any parent that's not worried about money, not killing their kid. They get until you know, so fill it out. And maybe I'm just different from the other people in here. But that's how I would see that. 
I mean, if it was your kid, I'm going to ask you the first one. If it was your child, what would you say, Melanie? If somebody says, we're not going to guarantee you funding, what are you going to do? I'm curious. Well, I would always okay. err on the other up. side, no matter what I was told. But that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but um, not many of the 373 students did, and that's what disturbs me about it. And I, I appreciate that we're going to have some more discussion, but the 373 students isn't the group of students who got their information in after the deadline. That's a much smaller number, right? Right. Now it's down to 30. We, we had were, originally had 31. There were 30 some odd students who did what they needed to do in the fall in terms of grades, did their community service, got their documentation in, but got it in too late. That's, That's the universe of students. Yeah, and actually, that, it was much larger than 31 because we worked through some extenuating okay. circumstances. Okay, and, 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 and I appreciate that. So we'll, we'll whittle down to 30 that didn't meet the extenuating circumstances. But again, they did what they needed to do in the fall, did their community service, got their documentation in, but it was too late. And I understand this. There is a real question about whether it's fair after the fact to go back. And I, and I appreciate that. It just, I, I, and I know we all do. I feel for these kids that did just about everything right but they miss the deadline and they lose everything. Um, and I know it is difficult after the fact to go back and do it, but, but that's the only, I mean, that's the entire universe of students that, that I, I was concerned about, which is those that did all of those things. Um, but, but anyway, I, I appreciate your attention to it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Looks like that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next we have Head Start and Ms. Thompson. I'm here to answer any questions you might have about my written reports. Any questions? Councilor Baker. Uh, it's more of a comment, and I think you know, we announced last time that, uh, that uh, they got 100%, which is extremely rare, and uh, uh, I just, I'd like to commend all of our staff and my I'll pass it on. I'll pass it on. I thought you'd probably touch everybody in this room. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Uh, and last, we have leadership. Mr. Enloe. I want to commend you on your campaign for mayor. And oh, it came thank up you. a little bit short, but we're all proud of you, I know, for the good run. And I've told several of the uh, council members today that I have a newfound appreciation for politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I've taught uh, as an adjunct professor at Northeastern State University and I thought, oh, teaching's not that hard until I did it once and I thought, I'll never do that again. <laughs> uh, but it was, a, it was a very valuable learning experience and uh, it was also good to get out and meet a lot of people. So, uh, But I do have newfound appreciation for what you guys go through. So, thank you. Questions? Uh, a, a couple of things, if I can. Uh, submitted the report, uh, but I also have a couple of items I would like to discuss uh, and highlight out of that report. Uh, one is 10 years of passport, and that's our employee development training uh, that we've been conducting for the last 10 years. And we're having our 10 year celebration on April 20th. And there's a gentleman in the back of the room that I haven't told him I'm going to do this, but I would like to recognize him. And that's uh, our leader of employee development, uh, Mr. Mark Skinner. And so Mark has done a great job working with the staff uh, to develop our employees, to teach them leadership skills, uh, to give them the resources that they need uh, to develop as an employee. It's not Where is It's not your report? Uh, send it. I uh, guess I need to get you some copies. My apologies. <laughs> I can't, I'll get you guys some copies before I leave out of here today. We get some copies. You want make some while he's here to ask questions? In fact, I can email somebody and have them print out copies, and maybe they'll be here before I get done. Questions at this point, or uh, 
Let me, if I can, cover a couple more items. Go ahead. Um, district choirs. Uh, those district choirs are for our younger kids to get involved in the choirs. Um, if you guys will look uh, throughout the previous months, we have no more than 10 students participating in those district choirs. Uh, we try to uh, coordinate um, leaders uh, throughout the 14 counties as much as possible, trying to get as many kids involved. So uh, I would like to encourage you to try and help us get more kids involved in the district choirs because it's a segue of teaching the language, teaching an art, uh, teamwork, um, and then uh, it segues into the youth choir as well. Um, so need your help in trying to get more students involved with the district choirs. Okay, Councilor Fulbright. Yes, thank you. I have a question on your comment of 10. Is that 10 all together or just 10? You said you had 10 students participating in the district choirs. In an individual district choir. Okay. So right. there's some that may be two or three, eight, Well, the six. last communication I had with uh, Michelle Lopez, there were only two Correct. at Salisaw. And I've never seen anything in any of the county papers about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, how were these people supposed to be notified that there were district choirs available to them? It did go out in the paper. Uh, we announced that um, when we started the district choirs, um, as well as last year. And so we did a marketing push to get that out to the newspapers, but we can't push that again um, if people are not do not know about it. I've got another question too. <laughs> uh, she did return some of my emails, but the last ones I haven't heard from her. My question was: Is it uh, the age limit of sixth grade only? Up, yes. Up to the sixth. Yep. And because that would be the next would be a transition point. A week. <laughs> Once a month. Once a week. Once a week. Okay. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Councilor Fishing Hook. Last month I requested a copy of the succession plan. Yes, ma'am. It was wanting to know about the time frame for it to actually work. I'm sorry? The time frame for it to actually work. How long have you all been working on the succession plan? And how long it takes to ready somebody? And I'm looking at the units right now. Did you get that to me? Because I never. No, ma'am, I did not. I was going to follow up with you, and uh, I missed that as I was going back through. Um, and I will get that to you this week. Okay. I also asked about an organizational chart from Chief Down showing citizens, other tribes, and non-natives. Did you get that? How far me? down did you want to go? I got some data from Michael Botello, but I'm going to have to recreate <laughs> some stuff to be able to. How far did you go down? Well, well I can go down. How far you want me to go? Okay. I mean, I, it would be. What did you get down on already? How far down? Did you well, start? I was just going to start at group leaders, but I didn't know how far down you wanted to go. Keep in mind, we got 3,500 employees. I'm curious about. Um, let me talk to you about afterwards, because really, in all honesty, I'd kind of like it to go down pretty far, pretty thorough. Okay. Because I figure it's just a query of some of it. You don't have to lump them different, but just a query of data. Okay, so we can talk out after the meeting. Okay, and the other one I requested over the last year the number of jobs created outside of gaming and how many turkeys were hired for those jobs. Yeah, that is a question I need, I've referred to CNB uh, so that they could follow up with that during ENF because I, I don't have that. I told I only asked three questions, you didn't answer none of them. I know it. I was terrible. Uh, horrible. It was terrible. I hope you can go to the next time. I will. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jordan, uh, Todd, yes. and I hate to belabor the point, and you may have somewhere got it to me, and maybe in all the paperwork I've missed it, but did we get the report showing the positions where the non-Cherokees were hired, and whether a Cherokee applied, and what our reason for not hiring them I'm was? still working on that one, okay. uh, to, because that we don't typically track all of that data. Uh, and so we're having to go back and recreate some of that. If you could get that to me, I'd sure, sure appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor Baker? Oh, I'm sorry. I was <coughs> okay. <laughs> did she have her in? She did. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Councilor Watts. <laughs> Thank you. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Are there others? 
Um, one last thing, two last things. Summer camps, uh, you guys, somebody asked a question about that earlier. I uh, handed out the copies of the applications. Um, one is for the day camp, one is for the residential camps. Uh, the residential camp will be held at the Squai <coughs> campus and it's for our older students, uh, sixth through 12th grade. And the day camps are for our kids uh, that are beginning first through the ninth grade uh, for next school year. And um, we announced the application. It went out in several newspapers. It went out online. Uh, that when it started taking applications on Monday, uh, by Thursday we received 40 applications already. Uh, so we're hoping to affect um, about 12 to 1500 kids with these programs. And Ms. Watts, Callan Watts, she will be pleased to know <coughs> that our environmental group has uh, agreed to participate in the camps as well. So they will commit five staff to work with the kids uh, throughout each of the summer camps. So we're very pleased that they're partnering up on this project as well. We've even talked about sampling the creek at Dwight Mission as part of their self-help and uh, learning experience to test the, the water in and around Dwight Mission. Councilor Jordan? Todd, on, on that one that is here the July 5th through the 8th, that's just a day camp, right? Sorry? The camp that's here, that's here mm -hmm. July 5th through the 8th, that's just a day camp, That's just right? a day camp, yes ma'am. And, and it's for grades 1 through 9, is that correct? That is correct. Do you break those down so the little kids are with the little kids and the bigger kids are there, with the... There are two different tracks, okay. and uh, we are organizing everything so that there will be a counselor for every 10 kids. Um, but uh, we split out two different tracks, uh, 6 through 9 and 10 through 14. Okay, uh, so, so that's it's ages six through nine. Six through nine. And ten through fourteen. Through 14. They'll be doing the same activities, but, but they'll, they'll be, be doing with kids of a similar age. On age group. Yeah. Okay. And a counselor for every ten students. Yes. So you won't lose any of them. That's that's okay. our that's our goal. Okay. <laughs> we don't want to lose way. any of them. <laughs> when they're going from one building to the next, we don't lose them. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, and we want to make sure that they're safe and they have a, an enjoyable time and experience. Can we just copy this and get yes, it? Yes, you can copy that, and it's also available online at camp.cherokee.org. And they can fill out, if they have internet access, they can fill out the application online, or the copy of that of those applications are there as well. And there is no income guidelines. No, okay, thank you very much. Yep. Council Watts. Thank you. If possible, could they do one of our scenic rivers so they could input that data into what's going on at the state level? Uh, yeah, we can take a look at that. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is coordinate uh, transportation. Uh, so if we do a field trip or something like that, to uh, coordinate uh, a driver and buses uh, to help us take kids to an off-site um, experience if we needed to. So we'll definitely take a look at that. <laughs> yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Baker? Yes, thank you. Is this limited to citizens within the jurisdictional boundaries or at large? At large. Uh, what we are doing is we've combined several different funding sources from Gen Fund to IHS, and uh, some of the funding um, is uh, says that it's open to any and all citizens of any recognized tribe. Uh, and so because of that, we are taking applicants, but we are pushing and advertising as much as we can to to our Cherokee citizens. We're trying to get as many involved in that as possible. Okay. Last thing, Trail of Tears Awards Assembly is tomorrow at Catoosa. I think you guys should have all uh, received notice of that during the Youth Council report. Uh, that is tomorrow at Catoosa and uh, starts at 10 o'clock. So we hope you can be there. We expect about 630 people. Our committee meetings are tomorrow morning from 10 to 12, unfortunately. Uh, so that's I'm right, I remember that. Sure most of us will I, be I able apologize to make it, for the scheduling on that. We were trying to work with the schools because many of them are doing academic testing and this is the only time that we can get them in the same place and get schools to participate. Madam Chair, yes, I do. Look, we are over time, so I'm going to really ask people. Uh, I'm going to take two more, and then that's it. We're going to cut this off. 
I just wanted to hear that public apology again real quick. Yeah. These are standing meetings. Yes. Uh, I know. I'm confused. It, it, we, there, the reason for that is we were trying to work with the schools and get as many of them to, to participate, uh, but they all have started end of year testing and and uh, we were very concerned that we weren't going to have so any schools participate. You'll announce where we're at doing business yes, with tribe before. Okay, thank yeah. you. I apologize. Councilor Fishinghawk, this will be the last question. That's what I want to ask more or less what she she said because I mean this is something that I guess we do every year. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, next, we move to old business. There is none pending. New business. There is none pending. Um, the announcement. Their next meeting is scheduled for Monday, May sixteenth at three p.m. Move for adjournment. Second. Second. I would also like to announce that the American Indian Symposium is going on this week at NSU, and anybody who can attend any of the sessions there, please do. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, any opposed? Aye. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We are adjourned.